Now we have John Hanacek with Developing General AI Blockchain and AR slash MR for Emergency Medical tri Triage Analog. Hey everybody, I'm John Hanacek. I'm going to record myself. So I, I'm wearing on space, you have to do everything yourself. I'm just kidding, it's all about the team, right? Thank you. So this talk is going to be in two main parts, and I'm going to describe what we have done so far with Mars Academy USA uh, analog astronautics missions in actual isolated and confined environments, and where we're going next, where we want to build technologies that reflect what we've learned to be able to enable next generation first response in any situation. So wherever you are in the middle of the marsh and surface or the middle of Kentucky, we want to be able to help you basically bring the hospital out to where you are instead of having to take you to the hospital. So before I get started, we got to thank the, the um, projects and studies are sponsored by Mars Academy USA, Avatar Medic Company, uh, Space Surgery Institute, and Mars Without Borders. So the general overview of our goal with the Avatar Medic system is to provide real-time remote relief anywhere, anytime. And this is conceptualized as being for space, where you're going to have folks exploring, you're going to have robotic assets, you're going to have satellites, you've, you've meshed up the, the planetary surface. And this is not unique to Mars, although this graphic is Mars, it's also Earth, right? We have CubeSats and different kinds of cool positioning systems and everything. And how do you create a system which could identify an injured astronaut and then route the correct response and take it from there? So we have been experimenting with pieces of this in actual analog situations by doing uh, things like go find the astronaut out in the middle of, this is a simulated medical extravehicular activity, or amoeba as we call it. So we go hide an astronaut out there, and then you have to go find the astronaut using a technology, in this case like a drone, a simple UAV. Can you do it? Can you orchestrate it? So how do you get the astronaut back to the habitat so you can actually save their life? How do you stabilize them and triage them? What are triage procedures for the surface of Mars? How do you work with having not just your patient in a suit, but you're in a suit as well? How do you feel this out? And not only that, but once you're in the hab, can you use new technologies, that's a mixed reality, I think we call it a spatial computer, to help uh, give real-time guidance through AI, which I'll get to more later, or remote teams, if you have that ability. So we're, we're doing this for our own sake, because like I'm saying, we really go out here and do this. So it's a funny paradox or a kind of a mixed challenge. We want to go out to these environments. In this case, this is 10,000 feet. I think some of these images are in Nepal, where this is an analog astronaut simulation mission. But that's a real isolated and confined environment. So and you can want to do the mission, but you also need to keep the people safe for real, not just for fake, right, for the mission. But you have to keep them safe for real. So we need to bring along a lot of medical expertise, not just to test, but to keep our people safe so they can actually do procedure and simulate being an astronaut without getting really hurt. We're always considering the technology readiness level and the human readiness level. So you probably have heard a lot about technology readiness level. This is where you take things uh, and assess how ready they are to be deployed in the real world, right? But there's also human readiness level, right? So we're developing not just technologies, but we're also developing protocols, and we're also developing people. So like if you heard Maria's talk earlier, we're working with the psychology of people. We're making sure they actually understand how to use the technology. Because if you give the best technology in the world to someone and they're not able to handle even basic function, they're, it's not going to help anyone. So with the specific Avatar Medic project, right, rep the logo here real quick, Avatar Medic project, right, uh, we're kind of more in the, the area of kind of a TRL of a two, right? We are past one because we've been doing a lot of experiments with HRL where we're developing procedures that we now want to roll up into technology. So with the technology for Avatar Medic, again, we're at a level two kind of thing because we've already observed quite a lot of things that we just want to solve for our own case and which will be uh, great for general space because of we're using an analog situation. 
And the reason we're so focused about human readiness levels and technology readiness levels is because we really need to know those things for real because we go out to varying levels of what we call fidelity to our simulation. So you've got lower Mustang in Nepal, that's 10,000 feet. These missions have concluded. This one just concluded. 10,000 feet, okay, you're starting to get a little uncomfortable. You know, it's starting to be a better analog for space, but you know, it's 10,000 feet, it's not that much. Then you go to 15,000 feet. Now you're starting to get into a different situation. Now you're starting to have real physiological issues. Now you're starting to have the potential for the crew, not just to be in simulated danger, but to be in real medical emergency. So with these missions, we have actual medical professionals that are on standby the entire mission to be the remote medical team to do not just simulations and experiments, but to physically assist the real crew to make sure they stay okay. And we keep going. Next, in February, we're going to Mount Everest, to 17,000 feet, to do uh, our highest fidelity mission yet. And this will present a lot of interesting challenges. However, the crew that's going on this mission is quite advanced. So we're the Mars Academy missions are attracting actual astronauts, attracting medical professionals, uh, and attracting uh, various kinds of technologists, because we're all focused on the same vision of trying to take space medicine and get it to a point where it's actually ready. It's TRL, it's HRL level ready. It has been verified enough that when we send it out to another planet, it's not an experiment, it's something that is ready to be deployed. So like I said, we keep doing experiments. And this is where the turning point kind of comes for the work that leads us into Avatar Medic and out of Mars Academy and into Avatar Medic, where we're doing, uh, this is real life, uh, but simulated, but in a real isolated and confined environment, doing tele-anesthesia, uh, tele-surgery overview. So you have real surgeons that are remotely situated, walking through a crew to do procedures of anesthesia and of general surgery. But it's not just about proving out technologies that are already here, because they don't work for space. You can't fly a hospital to Mars. It's not going to happen. You have to work with things that are going to be able to make sense in space, where you have a limited payload, you have harsh conditions, you can't bring all these specialty items. You have to bring general things. So we have things like 3D printing. This represents a, this is a real technology that we have been verifying its function and developing protocols around it, right? Because the technology without the procedure, you know, there's no manual for it, it's not going to help anyone. So this is called the VapoJet, and it's a 3D printed anesthesia device. Because did you know that they can't do surgery on the ISS right now? If an astronaut gets injured, critically injured, there's no surgery. Because anesthesia is a drip-based procedure, and it's complicated and heavy and everything. Oh wait, just kidding, not anymore. Now it's vaporized. Now it's a device that's 3D printed that uses traditional things like a bag valve mask to vaporize the anesthesia so that you can do surgery in microgravity. So this is what we're doing is we're developing the protocols using new technology to enable space medicine that's actually going to work. That's going to let us have the same quality of, of care for first response and for deeper hospital work on the surface of any planet. And since we've learned quite a lot, we're not just medical professionals and analog astronauts, we're also technologists, especially um, exponential technologists. So there are a lot of things that are available now that were just literally not available even a few years ago. And there are some things that are going to be available that aren't available right now, but that we know how to plan for. And this is a small list of what we're working with. Artificial intelligence is a big deal because you've already, everyone here in this room already understands that you're not gonna be calling home you can't actually do that with the latency of light. It's not going to work. You, you have to be able to solve your problems where you are. So we want to build a system where we have the intelligence of being a doctor, of being a first responder baked into the system because the system has watched and been present with so many people beaming through it that they will be able to, uh, that we'll be able to train software. Blockchain technology, it's really hyped, right? Everybody's talking about blockchains. There's a real reason for blockchains for us, which is that they provide a verifiable way of timestamping things. They're uh, fault tolerant. They respond well to being broken apart and brought back together because all the time signatures are more likely to sync up. And they're tamper resistant because we're dealing with medical documents, right? So we need things that are going to uh, scale out. 
of course, 5G, right, on Earth, you get 5G, you may even have some of that technology in space uh, to enable much larger bandwidth so that you're able to actually not just stream video, but multiple videos, not just stream, uh, you know, two-dimensional graphics, but to stream fully three-dimensional graphics. Then you have things like CubeSats, which you saw in the picture earlier. You know, of course, when you go to a planet, you have that. But here on Earth, we're starting to have CubeSat networks as well. Companies are building them. So we're going to work with that technology to enable uh, medical care in rural settings, right? Because sometimes we like to joke that the middle of Kansas and Mars are the same thing when it comes down to getting hospital care. Um, and that's something we want to change, right? We want to change that. And of course, spatial computing is the big one, right? This is the nexus where all these things come together, is the ability to display and have a computer that knows about space. It knows where it is in space, and it can show graphics that are three-dimensionally represented. This is going to make it much better for us to be able to show people how to do procedure, especially non-medically trained persons. Try to explain someone how to do an intubation versus try and show them how to do an intubation. You'll probably have more success showing them. Even better if you could just grab their arm, which is why we head into the robotics component of it, where we're going to add not just UAVs for surging, which we can test today, but we're also in, it's called the ANA Avatar X Prize. So if you know about X Prize, they were the ones who gave us, that. those prizes give us really fun things, one of them being the Virgin Galactic uh, space plane. And we are in one now to build a fully realized avatar system where a robotic component on one end is embodied by a remote operator. So this has a lot of benefits for us. We don't need it to be so human form, but the core technology of being able to embody a robot and drive a robot semi-autonomously, it's a big deal to be able to have that medic with you all the time. We've already made some proofs of concept about some of these ideas, and they're really promising. They also win hackathons, so that's also fun. As a way to do a, a fast pressure cooker of experimentation, I recommend doing some hackathons for your own ideas. But this one here is called Avatar Rescue. And Avatar Rescue is an application that we're going to be bringing to the market where we used, in this case, we used IBM's Watson to create a chat bot. So you talk to the computer, and it talks back to you. And we loaded it in with the procedures for doing basic triage and first response medical care. So this hypothesis here is that you could get a regular person to show up on scene with a victim that's down on the ground potentially, or they're having a distress, or any manner of triage, right? You have to figure out what's going on, and then you have to render aid. And this application demonstrates that we were able to build a system that would ask the user what's going on, the user would give information, and it would take them down a different branch, all the way to potentially showing them, for example, how to do CPR, which is a big one. And it's also, coming back to the spatial computing part, we added the spatial computing component even to this prototype because we wanted to see what it looks like to have a, a graphic show you how to do CPR, and it's really compelling. This isn't very complicated, but to have someone show you how to do CPR when you need it most, they show you that your elbows have to be locked, right? In the movies, everyone goes like this because they can't. You can't kill Tom Cruise. That's a lot of insurance. You know, you can't kill Tom Cruise. <laughs> you have because it's two-inch depression, right, on somebody's chest to go down, and you're going to break a rib. So it's a much easier thing for us to show this right on top of the patient and show the timing of it, show the body position, than to try and explain it, especially to someone who's panicked. So this is a lot of uh, this was a lot of uh, testing, and we're really excited to keep bringing this specific product to market. And it has a lot of breadcrumbs for what I'll talk to you about a little bit later in the talk. Here we also have experimented with mapping. You've got to be able to see where you are, and we have some pretty good maps. You know, maps kind of change the world. But now we have three-dimensional technologies, and we can have real-time maps. So in this case, we experimented with, what if you used, it's called higher ground, because it helps you find higher ground. So if there's a flood plane in this instance, it will show you where the plane is coming in, where you are, and where uh, egress or evacuation point is to help you more effectively route. Well, you can imagine this being a dust storm or any other number of, of uh, catastrophic types of events giving you that bird's eye view where you are. And we took this concept further, actually, because search and rescue, as you've seen from some of the images before, it's a big part of what we train for, because you're going to have teams out there doing EVA, and if they have a crisis, you're going to need to come and be able to find them. And you might need to be able to search locations, especially if they're, you lost contact with where they are. So in this case, we developed a, this is a multi-user 
uh, augmented reality application that we got to use on a real 5G network because AT&T had stood one up for, for a hackathon. And we were able to develop a system where uh, multiple users could walk around and it would stream the video through to a kind of what we call God view, which is the mission control that can see a map. In this case, we picked an interior of a building, right? But it's easier actually to imagine the surface of a planet. And the user, the search and rescuer, can walk around and leave markers right where they are. And as they go, they're all shared, persistent across the experience. So the incident commander sees everything of everywhere that's going on. So hazard, I'll leave it, go around, go around, I'll go around. And I'll, I'll you populate out a map. We also want to, later on, we'll bring in actual, um, what they call SLAM, which is scanning the inside of the room and building up a map. Um, and you can start to see where we have a lot of experience with trying to coordinate things using radio. And it turns into a, turns into a bit of a, um, a waste show pretty quickly with radio because you have such a finite bandwidth. So with this, we already see these great glimmers of being able to, instead of trying to explain where everyone is, this is the map. It's where they all are. Oh, they're all searching here. They found five things there. Oh, look, the victim's right there. Let's go to them. Makes it a whole new experience, and we're really excited, again, not just for space, but for Earth, because what we're working on building with these groups of concept is to bring it all together, and not just have these be different apps or different systems or different technologies, but one integrated holistic system for medical triage and, inter and intervention that spans the entire solar system. One service made out of endless numbers of systems that would respond to any medical emergency anytime, anywhere, no matter what. Aid will be rendered, no matter what. No matter the resource, whether it's a robot, a totally untrained person, the best medical team in the world, a bunch of astronauts, doesn't really matter to us, actually. What we're doing is by researching the realities of isolated confined environment and by practicing the new medical procedure and defining new medical procedure and integrating them with the modern day technology, we're going to be able to radically upgrade first response for a new era and hopefully connect not just remote people connected out to the field, but also make the field a more survivable place so they don't have to go all the way back to the hospital. We want to close all the gaps in first response technology. So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, it's beginning. Uh, like I said, we're at TRL2. But HRL, we're, we're higher. We're, 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 we know what we want. Um, and we're always learning more about what we need. But the goal right away is, as I was saying, to take kind of mid-2020. So that's coming up this, this next year. We want to take that Avatar Rescue app and really get that fleshed out so we can throw it into the hands of regular users and start getting, see what happens with regular people if they try to be walked through uh, medical intervention and first response protocols. We'll also, of course, take it into our Mars Academy missions and see what more professional types of folks who have already had this training, how do they respond to it. And this is going to help us immensely in building up uh, the kind of knowledge that we need to actually build a useful AI that would be able to help you render first aid because our goal is to have anyone off the street, could be anyone, you, you, anyone, no matter what your training is, you could save a life using the assistance of the software. And this expands toward the end of 2020, we're taking the approach of using the spatial computers and the, that kind of technology with holographics and these kinds of things, you know, woo, -woo graphics, right? Multi-user experience of being able to share graphics, share, perception, share video, share avatar forms, you can say, look at this, don't do that, <laughs> why do you, you grab this? And be able to augment the training protocol that people are already doing who are professionals. And then we're gonna weave these threads together, so we have the AI just-in-time instruction component, and we have the spatial computing training component. We're gonna weave them together later, more middle of 2021, this is our plan is to start building out the system so that it could be something that would work in real time for a much wider range of condition and start living on its own. So all the way up through 2020, 2021, it's gonna be building out the system. It's gonna be exploring you know, what are the, the problems with the technology. And by the end of 2021, we wanna start testing this for use in real life medical emergency. So we'll use our knowledge of simulations we we'll use the professionals that we already have many partnerships with to be able to work with uh, the, the right stakeholders to begin to make 
simulations that will let us get ready to have it be the time of someday in the future, 2024 time, be able to pull some glasses out or you're already wearing them, and if someone has a problem, the system will instantly start explaining to you how to help them, and it will call the relevant experts, and it will also inform the hospital, and everything will work as one synchronized whole. It's a big lift, but it's possible. Not only that, but I mentioned robots, right? We're in this Anna Avatar X Prize. It's sponsored by the Japanese airline because they want to disrupt air travel. They think the future might be that we just embody a robot to do a task or a meeting. And we'll see if that happens for regular people, but we're pretty confident that for medical professionals, the ability to beam in the world's greatest surgeon and embody a robot would be a pretty cool technology to have. So that's where we're focused on, for the immediate term, uh, for us products, we're focused on the technologies that exist, the AI types of things, and the spatial computers. That exists already. And we're building robots so that by 2024 time, when the competition has ended, and we have achieved either the full prize or some at least development, we will merge these together so that the system, the spatial computer system, is designed to work with a robot so that if robots show up on scene, they can help you or you can bring the robot with you and vice versa. So. It's very exciting to try and take all this knowledge that we have and roll it up into technology. It's going to be a really uh, interesting ride. We have a really great team doing this. Uh, we, they, we're very committed to being transdisciplinary because a lot of what we're trying to do just doesn't exist. So the best way to do things like that is to have people who know, a, you know, have your team know a bit about everything so that when you put it together, you don't miss. That's why we're really key to stress the human readiness level in addition to technology readiness level. And we're always thinking about how everything meshes together and how you create a coherent whole. I'm just going to show you the team really quick because it's really fascinating that Avatar Medic represents kind of one of those moments where, I don't know if you serve, but like a wave is coming up and it just has to break. This is the time. These folks who have come together for this project, myself included, are all people who have, especially the medical professionals, are people who they've gone down the road. They've seen their experts in their field. They're two of the world's uh, most famous surgeons who use mixed reality technologies in, to try and push the limits of what they're able to achieve. And the time has come now to actually build a technology that represents what they want to be real. So we have other folks coming in like Dr. Jeremy Sajay. He's, he does a parabolic flight. So he tests medical procedures in parabolic flight. So we'll really test these devices and microgravity, see if they work, see if they don't. We're really serious about building a system that would save lives on Earth and in space, right? We're very serious about that. 25-year Navy uh, corpsman veteran who has experienced the challenges of trying to watch a CD really quickly and do a procedure that he's never done before, right? So now we get to take this experience of these people's kind of hard-fought um, challenges and get to roll it up into technology so that the young pups uh, who are exploring space you know, even younger than me, it's going to be young, young pups, they won't know the, ha the hardships of not having instant medical knowledge. They won't get it. They'll be like, what do you mean? You didn't just have the Avatar Medic? And we'll be like, no, we didn't have the Avatar Medic. We had to learn things in our head and hope we remembered. So with that, I'd like to thank our collaborators uh, and partners. And um, please, anyone in here who's interested in this, anyone who knows anyone who's interested in this, reach out. It's a big uh, it's a big vision. There's a lot of things that need to happen. But like our team, if you are interested in this, you'll be interested in this. You'll, you'll come over. It's the same thing happened to me, the same thing happened to the other team members. You say, oh, yeah, space medicine, next generation first response. OK. You know, so please, come on over. Our doors are open. And I'd like to, and this is the, all the info. This is my number and everything. It's all very transparent. And now I'd like to open it up to questions. Thank you. So I'm on Mars in a building. You can have a photograph representing the actions I should take on my buddy. And then, and, and so how large a device is this photograph and in how many places could I put it in a, in a, in a base? This is a good question. So what we're building is hardware agnostic uh, in the sense that there are a couple ways to achieve holograms. Um, one of them, of course, is doing an actual hologram with light that's a coherent light, and that might be something you could install in a hab. You could have that. 
But one of the easiest ways to do it is to trick your eyes by using those kinds of uh, mixed reality glasses. Okay, that put so, it so I just pick up a pair. You can let's let's imagine you pick up a pair. They could be you know similar to how AEDs are around yeah. the room. Right. You right. could grab a pair. You may already be wearing a pair, or you're already wearing visors. Right. You're an astronaut after all. So the software can automatically kick in at a low routine level. And it's effectively what you're describing. It, it seems uh, relatively simple. It's really hard to implement it in practice. But it's one of those things where you're like, yeah, I really want this. If somebody got hurt, it would be great to have uh, something just instruct you of what to do. And this is also where the robots come in, is eventually, maybe they don't just show you, but they kind of just say, oh, give me that. <laughs> I'll just save their life for, the, for you, <laughs> you know? So anyway, any other questions? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, oh, I got a bunch, but uh, I guess I'll just ask, uh, walk us through what you think might be possible, say, over the next decade as technology improves in terms of what, a, uh, what can be rendered in the field if you only have a, a, a lay person or, let's say, a robot uh, working through it. It's, hands. Yeah, it's a good question. I think if we define first, um, if the lay person, for example, only had a pair of um, you know, consumer grade mixed reality glasses, let's say, like a Magic Leap version 12 or whatever, if you've seen those kind of things. If they only had that, the most they can do is what a skilled first responder can do, um, which is plug holes, put pressure, uh, you know, manipulate or not manipulate things, render rescue breathing, do CPR. The difference being, of course, that when you happen upon someone alone in today's world, that's it. I mean, you better hope that you can call 911 or something. But in this case, the system will observe you beginning to do the procedure and try and notify someone. So there's, with just the headset, our goal is that in 10 years, the system will be what we'd like is it's baked in at the low level routine for every operating system for these kinds of classes. So that no matter what hardware you're wearing, that if it detects emergency, you can do certain things like blood gives off a certain spectral um, presence to even an RGB camera, things like this. You can develop ways for the software, like you're looking for danger, and be able to render aid. The good thing is that a lot of the procedures for doing first response are tried and tested. It's not so much a matter of innovating. We do need to innovate for genuine space, right? But for Earth, just getting those procedures out to the person where they need them, that's going to save a life. Now, if you've got your Batman-style utility belt that we want to build, or you've, you're walking alongside some kind of robot, or it's rolling alongside you, then things get more interesting. Um, with advances in synthetic biology and kind of material 3D bioprinting and um, uh, a harmonic ultrasonic uh, repatterning of tissue, we can imagine in 10 years there will be demonstrations from our team and other teams of dynamically regrowing tissue in the field, um, potentially moving large bones. I have a hypothesis we could uh, reset a bone using ultrasound and things like this, but it's a lot of work to do. So within 10 years, if I'll be safe and say that we can describe whatever medical procedure is needed, and then the robotic stuff will starting to be tested there, and you may be able to at least have quick clot like the soldiers have, where they dump it in. And it's not just a clotting agent, but we really want to be able to um, do genuine tissue repair. So instead of scarring, instead of uh, tourniquets and things, you start to imagine repairing tissue. So that's probably where we'll be in 10 years. Not crazy sci-fi, but we're, in 10 years, we'll be starting to get toward the sci-fi. So I'm gonna, I'll take his question back. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Um, I was just wondering, on the point of 3D printing, you mentioned the International Space Station doesn't have any capabilities for uh, medical applications. For, for anesthesia. They okay. can't do anesthesia. They actually have a 3D printer, which is why that researcher uh, developed the VapoJet technology, because you could 3D print that in the ISS um, and render. But the, the challenge, of course, and why I keep going back to human readiness factors is, if you have the ability to do something, but you no one's trained on how to do it, you know, if I gave, if, if I, even if I had a scalpel right now, I'm not going to do neurosurgery on you. You know, you need the procedure. So there's a hand in hand that that's what we're doing. But we're trying to work with space based constraints because if you build something that's ready for space, you better believe it's ready for Earth. You know, it's ready for anything. Is there a question? Thank you. What else could you, if you had, if you had the, your AR goggles and you had a haptic suit, mm -hmm. what could you, what level could you do at that point? Yeah, so it's a great question, and this is a part of the way we're designing the system is to have haptic suit in mind, because the biggest thing that's a challenge for a remote um, advisor is situational awareness. So when you're in the field, you've got sensations going on. It's hot, it's cold, there are pressures, there are differences in air density, 
There are sounds, there are smells. Smells are also part of what we're doing. And so you want to be able to beam that over because the remote medical obs uh, observer or expert, even the AI, they sh in our system, they shouldn't just be, the avatar medic itself is not just there to help you with medicine. It's also there to keep you safe. So it's able to perceive, if you have an expert that says, well, it just got really cold here. What's going on? Are you okay still? You may have totally forgotten or not been paying attention to your own body, but a remote person wearing a haptic suit can. Now, it goes the other way, too. If you notice that the first responder is starting to have some challenges, their vital signs are having some perturbations, you might be able to subtly warm up their suit, vibrate their suit, um, you know, squeeze them a little bit. Uh, do things where the haptic suits, from our perspective, are something of a general technology that will let you stream over information, they will serve as an interface, but they'll also be a way to um, render aid directly. So inside of the future astronaut suit, if you get a bleed for some reason, the suit can constrict physically around you, notify the system, okay, that's bleeding control going on, the system's doing da da da, and it's all, um, you know, it's all seamless, right? Um, now, of course, you have to think about you don't want to send real pain to a remote observer, so we're working on all that. But thanks for the question. Are there any other questions? Or I think we're out of time. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Please get in touch.